So, Nick, the president warning Iran don't, and yet it does seem the feeling is that do is perhaps what Iran is going to go with. The question is what they do and how they decide to do this and the varying degrees of escalation we might be considering here. Right. I mean, there are a lot of different scenarios here. Obviously, the nightmare scenario we're all looking at is a direct strike on Israel from Iran. Uh, the intelligence assessments we're hearing about are very mixed on that score because a strike from Iran on Israel, I mean, so far this has all really been done by proxies, uh, Iranian proxies in Lebanon. But a direct strike could essentially then force Israel to retaliate directly against Iran. And then what do you have? A uh, regional war. Uh, and then the U.S. has said it's going to defend Iran, uh, excuse me, defend Israel, that uh, that alliance is ironclad. Uh, then you get the U.S. pulled in, potentially other allies, potentially allies of Iran. So it's really a very, very toxic mix right now. And uh, what we are hearing is an attack possibly within the next 48 hours. So we're all on standby for that. The commander of U.S. Central Command was sent to Israel. Nick, what is his job there? Is he advising Israel on what to do, mapping out different possibilities, or is he there to direct U.S. support if it's needed? Well, I think it would be directing U.S. support in part because we know the U.S. has uh, uh, destroyers, naval destroyers in the region whose primary function in that case would be air defense. So mm -hmm. I think the, what you're seeing there is an anticipation that the most likely scenario is a missile barrage of some sort, either from proxies or from Iran directly, and they're going to need all the help they can get defending against those. Uh, in terms of some sort of Israeli response, I mean, Israel has said it will hit back if attacked. Yeah. Uh, but I would be very uh, surprised to see any sort of U.S. assets involved in that, at least from the start. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly, I mean, there has been this relationship throughout this entire uh, event since October 7th, yeah. where the U.S., the Pentagon, has been advising Israel and, and talking to them about how to shape their campaign against Hamas. So a lot of back and forth between these two countries. Well, and we have seen more recently a sharpening of criticism of the Israeli government in regard to its policy in Gaza, certainly from President Biden right. and others in the administration, suggestions that U.S. policy could change if Israeli policy does not. Would an attack from Iran or a proxy make it that much more difficult for the U.S. to exercise that kind of leverage over Israel? Yes. I mean, I think one's, one of the speculations out there is that the, one of the reasons why Iran is planning to do this now is because they are sensing and want to exploit this friction and test this friction between the U.S. and Israel. But but, I mean, listen, there has been talk by the administration about the need to, uh, for, for Israel to take more action to protect civilians and things like that. But where the rubber meets the road on military support, there is absolutely no daylight between the U.S. and Israel. I mean, Joe Biden is not going to budge on that support. He's going to make sure every, Israel gets absolutely everything it needs. Yeah. Nick, thank you. Your team's reporting has been essential thank for you. us this week. Nick Wadhams. In our Washington bureau here at Bloomberg, former President Trump and Speaker Mike Johnson, meantime, set to hold a news conference, as we mentioned, at Mar-a-Lago this hour. We're told it's about to begin. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Megan Scully. Uh, Megan, the Speaker of the House, had to get on an airplane after an important vote today, actually showing up a bit late. This was supposed to start about a half an hour ago, as they managed uh, to pass a renewal, a two-year extension of the FISA warrantless spy program, Section 702. This is something that Donald Trump said should be killed. Yes. Um, it's been passed. It's a slightly different version. Maybe he takes credit for uh, a bit of a rewrite here. But what's the baseline for these two. We're told they're talking more. Do they have a good relationship? It's going to be very interesting to see their body language and to read between the lines of this press conference. Does Donald Trump stick his arm around Mike Johnson and, and does he <laughs> cast his lot with him or do we see some distance between the two? Yeah. He is going down there after this vote on FISA, the foreign intelligence bill, and um, notably there was an amendment that hardliners pushed to require warrants, mm -hmm. and that failed on a tie vote. Mike Johnson voted against the amendment, so he's going down there without much support mm -hmm. from his far right. We are just seeing Donald Trump now entering the room at Mar-a-Lago. The House Speaker, Mike Johnson, is standing just behind him. We will, of course, keep you apprised of what it is they say. We are expecting, though, Megan, that a lot of these remarks will be focused on the subject of election integrity. And they might be introducing legislation around non-citizens voting, something that is not common to begin with, but perhaps as an effort they would like to jointly pursue. 
it's an area that they can agree on, even though, as you said, and we can't stress enough, it is not something that is that is prevalent in our elections. Mm -hmm. Non-citizens cannot vote in our elections, and there is no evidence that it has changed the tide in any election in, in history. There's a big question about what happens to Ukraine funding uh, and if it will hit the floor next week or anytime soon. This feels like a jump ball right now, that it yeah. actually depends on what happens at Mar-a-Lago between these two men. Is that safe to say? Well, they might be talking about election security yeah. at the podiums. We can guarantee they're talking about Ukraine when they get off um, and how exactly this package is going to come together. Mm -hmm. Mike Johnson wants to get this through despite calls from members of his Congress, uh, members of his conference to oust him, Marjorie Taylor Greene most notably, if he brings this to the floor. They're already angry about the FISA vote today. Yeah. So um, it is... How this is packaged is going to be very important, but perhaps even more important is how Donald Trump responds to that. All right, Bloomberg's Megan Scully, who leads our congressional coverage, thank you so much. Now, we are hearing from former President Trump as we speak. He began his remarks talking about the border. He said he would like to demand that our border be closed because we have billions of people coming into our country. Of course, billions is not the kind of numbers we have seen in border patrol data, more like hundreds of thousands in individual months. He, again, reiterating the line that they come from jails and prisons, and they've come from all over the world. So this is the kind of conversation, Joe, that they are having in Mar-a-Lago right now, the idea that Biden doesn't need legislation to close the border, remembering yeah. that Donald Trump killed the border or played a part in killing the border deal that President Biden had agreed to. Yeah, that's true. And we're still waiting for details on uh, Joe Biden's executive action that was floated earlier this week by the president himself in an interview on Univision. The border was not the purpose uh, of this event. But when we get to policy that involves the Speaker of the House, specific to some of the issues we've been talking about today, the renewal of FISA 702, the potential uh, for a deal on Ukraine aid, we'll let you know when we do get hard news today from Mar-a-Lago. Absolutely. Now, it seems that they are moving on to talk about election integrity. And Trump just said that the speaker is doing a very good job under very tough circumstances. For more on those tough circumstances, we want to go to someone else who covers Congress and all of the circumstances within it. Jonathan Tamari of Bloomberg Government is also joining us. And it's worth pointing out that as Speaker Johnson stands there next to Donald Trump, he has some very big vulnerabilities of his own, a potential motion to vacate hanging over his head that is helping probably to define the policy decisions that he makes going forward. Jonathan, we have FISA done now. There's questions around Ukraine aid. How does anything move forward from here when you're in Johnson's position? Right. And, and as Megan pointed out, this FISA vote got through the House, but it's also cost him a little bit even more ground than he already had lost among his right flank. So he's in an even more shaky ground now, and he's signaled that he wants to take up the Ukraine bill next week, which could be even more toxic with some members of his conference. And there's a big challenge for him because he's going to need Democratic votes. But if he wants to keep the right on board with him, he's going to probably want to attach some things to that Ukraine bill that would lose some Democratic votes. So it's a difficult process, and it's in a very different place than when it passed the Senate a couple months ago because there's more concern on the left as well about Israel's conduct. So what looked like a bill that could pass the House with major bipartisan support a couple months ago is in a much tougher position now as we sit here in April. Well, so I know we don't have legislation here, Jonathan, so I'm asking you probably a difficult question here, but do we have any sense of whether this is a loan, whether we're going to use uh, repossessed uh, assets from Russia or how exactly uh, the money would be sourced, if not just moving that Senate bill that we've been talking about? Yeah, I think that's what we're all going to be look, watching for today and over this weekend to see which version he puts forward. There's been a lot of things floated. He hasn't committed to any. And we're just waiting to see that because there's a lot of different ways to do this. But he's got to count the votes with each different version and figure out what can actually clear the House.